Thanks, Thibaut, and, uh, and really excited to be back for the third Elm Europe. Very exciting. This has uh, uh, like been exciting the last two years, and I'm super excited to see what, what goes down this year. <clears throat> all right, so this is Some Types All the Way Down. I'm Richard Feldman. So I want to start with a quote. This is a quote from Evan. Custom types are the most important feature in Elm. This is something that he says in the official Elm guide, um, which is a pretty strong statement to make. And uh, we've talked a lot about custom types, like in the past Elm Europe's, um, about uh, how you can use them to do opaque types and all sorts of different things you can do with them. Um, but in this particular paragraph of the guide, Evan actually goes uh, in a slightly different direction. He says they have a lot of depth, especially once you get in the habit of trying to model scenarios more precisely. So things like making impossible states impossible and so forth. He says, I tried to share some of this depth in types as sets and types as bits in the appendix of the guide. I hope you find them helpful. So uh, if you take nothing else away from this talk, I would definitely recommend going and checking those out. Those are uh, new of the, like, the Elm 19 uh, version of the guide, and they're really interesting, and we'll talk a little bit in this talk about some of the stuff that's in them. Okay. So uh, reading this, you know, when I first got into custom types, I was kind of like, oh, what, what, what is this? What, what can I build with these? Because my background before Elm was I'd never really used a language that had them. And as I got used to them more and more and kind of started doing more things with them, I was eventually like, wow, you can build a lot of stuff with these. What can't I build with them? And then eventually one thing led to another. And if you're me, that kind of ends up with like, what if I built everything with them? Just absolutely everything. Which then led me to the premise of this talk, which is what if the only language feature Elm had was custom types? And we tried to rebuild everything else, like all the other foundational stuff in the language from just that. But could we? Could we actually build all that? Let's find out. So the, the goal of this talk primarily is to sort of uh, be mind expanding. It's not to give you like, oh, this is a really concrete, specific, practical technique that you're going to need to go and apply. It's more just to be like, oh, I didn't know that, or I didn't realize you could do that, or like, I never thought about this that way. So please don't feel too bad if you're listening to some of the stuff that I'm going to be talking about and you're thinking like, that went over my head, or I didn't understand all of it, or maybe like, uh, you know, I'm having too much fun and not learning enough. This is just going to be a drink from the fire hose of a lot of different stuff. And um, hopefully, uh, by the end of it, you'll say, I learned some new things. And you'll think, yeah, and if I decide that actually this thing was useful or that thing was useful and something that comes up in the future, you can go back and look at it and learn about that one particular thing more in depth. All right. So what if the only language feature Elm had was custom types? How would we rebuild? All right. Well, here's an easy one to start with, bool. Uh, this is an easy one to define in terms of custom types because it just is a custom type that exposes its variants. Um, there's not a whole lot else to bool. Uh, the name bool comes from the, uh, the person who invented uh, Boolean algebras. So this is George Bool, an 18th century English mathematician. Uh, Brian Hicks posed an interesting question. He's like, why did we shorten it by one letter? Like, his name's already really short. You know, why, why didn't we just call it the guy's real name? My theory is maybe because people say Boolean usually, and they shorten to Boolean to Bool, but eh, that's what happens if you have a, a thing named after you. Sometimes you just get one letter shortened. Um, but we're going to go with uh, B-O-O-L, because that's what pretty much every language goes with. Um, one thing to note about Bools is that uh, if is based on Bools. This is one of the things in the language where the actual compiler and the syntax is sort of connected to the standard library. Like, this is a syntax sugar that relies on bool existing in the language because the condition inside the if has to be uh, a bool. But, you know, if we didn't have if, if we didn't have that syntax sugar, you could just use the desugared version, which is just writing the case expression by itself. This is exactly the same, right? Doing an if versus doing a case and then explicitly pattern matching on the true or false. Really, if is nothing more than syntax sugar for this exact case expression. So if we didn't have if, uh, we, we could live without it. But yeah, let's be honest, if is kind of nice. So this is sort of the, the uh, recurring theme we're going to see, if we rebuild everything from scratch, we're probably going to lose some syntax sugar niceties along the way. Um, another way we could go with it is we could say, uh, let's make bool an opaque type. Uh, let's, let's decide that we're not going to expose its variance, we're just going to expose the type bool, and then we'll expose true and false, which will be defined internally, but not exposed. What would that do? Well, I mean, usually the reason that you do uh, opaque types is you want to do something like you want to restrict things, you want to create guarantees. But here we're not really creating any guarantees, we're exposing these incredibly simple values. Also, another reason you might want to do it is backwards compatibility. Like, what if we want to add more variants in the future? 
I'm going to put out there, if you decide to add more variants to bool, you messed up. That was not a good idea. Like, really, you should just stick with those two. Um, so in this case, I think making this an opaque type doesn't really make a whole lot of sense. And there is a downside to this, which is you lose out on pattern matching. Like, you can no longer write case maybe bool of and, and put the true and false inline if you've made it opaque like this. So this is one of those cases where I would say, yeah, you know what? Actually, I wouldn't use an opaque type. I would just expose the variants. Speaking of maybe, uh, let's look at maybe. That's another really easy one to rebuild from scratch because, again, it's just a custom type that exposes all of its variants. So there are two variants here, nothing and just, and uh, there's a type variable of A, so you can put whatever you want inside of a maybe, which is nice. Uh, this also comes from a mathematician. This is the uh, French mathematician Yvette Maybe. Um, that's not true. I made that up. Um, and the, you might recognize this, uh, this person is not a mathematician from the 18th century. Um, <coughs> But I don't know, maybe it was. <laughs> uh, so uh, maybe is the term that Elm and also Haskell used for this. But it actually appears in quite a few different languages, and they all have sort of different terminology for it. Um, so Scala and Rust, for example, it's almost identical, except they call it option. And instead of nothing and just, they use none and some. I don't know if those are like better or worse names. There is kind of a neat thing that they have the same number of letters, so they, they're sort of the same length and a pattern match, which is kind of neat. Um, but on the other hand, I always think, like, if I, do I have none or do I have nothing? I usually think nothing, so what are you going to do? Um, also worth noting that another one that comes up is optional. That's another term for this. Uh, so Swift uses this, and actually Swift has syntax sugar on top of this. So in, in Swift, you can say optional string, or you can say string question mark, and that's sort of a shorthand for optional string. Uh, fun piece of trivia, I actually found a very old GitHub discussion from like 2012, 2013, where Evan was actually considering this for Elm. He was like, hey, maybe we should have a question mark thing for maybe. Um, obviously didn't end up <laughs> making it into the language, but it's interesting that that was sort of of, uh, on the table at some very early point in the language's uh, existence. Uh, Java also uses the term optional. Interesting thing about Java, Java does not have custom types. So they have the sort of the concept here, uh, but they implement it in terms of different stuff under the hood, and they actually sort of make it opaque. Um, they have like optional and optional.empty, which gives you an empty uh, one, which is to say nothing or none. And then they have optional.of, which is to wrap the thing up as, as like a just or a sum. And then they have get, which is basically uh, assume it's a just, and give me back the value, and if not, runtime exception, which clearly is not how we would go in Elm. Um, but yeah, cultural differences, what are you going to do? Um, another really easy thing to rebuild from scratch is unit. Uh, this is quite easy to define using a custom type. Type unit equals unit, done, done deal, that's it. Um, so this is kind of the whole point of unit, is to have a value where it only has one variant. Uh, you may have seen this in uh, main, like the type of main sometimes has a unit there if you're not using any flags. Um, also in Elm tests, uh, unit tests in Elm tests take a unit, which is kind of fun. Um, uh, OCaml, Haskell, and Rust, uh, along with Elm, all have this sort of uh, open paren, closed paren syntax for unit. Uh, but there's no particular reason that you need to. I mean, the, the whole point of it is just to say, I have a thing which only has one uh, possible value, and that is itself. And so doing it this way is perfectly fine. In fact, this is literally what PureScript does. PureScript does not have syntax sugar for this. They just have a type called unit in the standard library, which only has one variant, which is called unit. Um, either way is perfectly reasonable, but you know, uh, there's readability trade-offs and so forth, and kind of there's a history to, to having this as open friend, closed friend. But certainly, if we're rebuilding everything from scratch, uh, we can get by with just defining this. Um, speaking of like different pieces of terminology in different languages, so in Elm, we call this custom type. And I think uh, I haven't asked Evan the exact reason for this, but my intuition is that if you want to make a custom type, this is the language feature you use, uh, the custom type. Um, but other languages call it different things. So Haskell and Scala both call it algebraic data type, which is kind of a mouthful, so it's usually ADT for short. Um, Rust and Swift both call it enum, which is short for enumeration which I guess is probably due to this sort of like a legacy feature of like enums in languages like C and Java. Um, and so they sort of like added features to that. So it's not just an enumeration, but they're like, well, it's, it's like that, but with more features. Uh, so they chose the enum keyword for that. So different languages have different names for it. Um, and as we'll see later, there is one term that encompasses all of these. Um, OK, so cardinality is uh, one of the topics that comes up in the uh, types as sets thing. This is a quick primer on how cardinality works. Uh, so it's basically the number of elements in a set. And so we're thinking about what are the sort of sets of values that each of these types permits. So uh, inside types is sets. Evan gives some examples of, of different things like this. Um, so the cardinality of the unit type is one because there's only one alternative. There's one element in the set of values that exist inside that unit type. 
Bool has a cardinality of two because there are two possible different values there. And uh, you can see that by basically just counting up the number of different things on the side there. Gets a little bit trickier if you actually have parameterized types and you actually are holding on to values, as we'll see a little bit later. Um, but as you can guess, if we wrote some sort of custom type for our application, this is not something that's in the Elm standard library, of course. Um, status of loading, loaded, or errored, uh, this would be one, two, three is a cardinality of three. Okay, so uh, taking this one step further well, with our maybe that we've got built up here, uh, maybe bool has three different possibilities and you can kind of imagine these, uh, counting them up by thinking about what you would do if you wanted to make an exhaustive pattern match on them in a case expression. So there's just true, just false, and nothing. So that's one, two, three total things. Uh, maybe unit is gonna be one fewer than that, so it's just unit or nothing. Uh, so a total of cardinality of two. And maybe status with the, the three alternatives is gonna have just loaded loaded or errored, or nothing, which is a total of uh, cardinality of four. So uh, you notice uh, a pattern here, which is that if you look at uh, maybe bool, uh, it's sort of like one from the maybe, which is to say maybe adds on one extra possibility uh, by virtue of nothing. Maybe unit adds one more. Uh, maybe status adds one more. So maybe as a custom type, essentially adds one to the cardinality of whatever the uh, the cardinality is of the thing that's held inside of it. Um, so this is uh, sort of maybe gives you an intuition for why the broad term, no matter what language you go to, uh, for what custom types are, is they're known as sum types. So they have sort of like the sum of all of the different possibilities inside of them uh, it adds up to the cardinality of that particular type. Okay, so those are some types. Um, here's a different type of type, uh, case status comma bool. So this is a tuple. And uh, here we have uh, different possibilities that are due to the fact that we have multiple different things inside of our tuple. So we could have loading true, loading false, loaded true and false, and then errored true and false. And this would have a total cardinality of six because those are, there are six different possible combinations of that. Um, so the, the, uh, if you look at this in terms of like how did we get there from the individual cardinalities, status has a cardinality of three, like we saw on the previous slide. Bool has a cardinality of two. And if you multiply those two together, sure enough, you get the cardinality of six. Um, interestingly, whether or not we did this with a tuple or we did this with a record, we still get the same number of combinations because we still have one status and one bool. And if we try to figure out how many different possible combinations of those there are, uh, it's the same thing. It's the number of uh, the cardinality of the status times the cardinality of the bool, which gives you the same cardinality of six. So because we're doing multiplication now based on the number of different elements inside either the record or inside the tuple, these are known as product types. So a, a product type would be a record or a tuple, basically something where you have multiple different uh, uh, things inside it sort of coexisting at the same time. Whereas with some types, it's more about, okay, we're gonna pick one of several alternatives and they have different relationships with their cardinalities. Um, let's say we wanted to actually create a product type for our system because, hey, we're building everything up from scratch. Here's one way we could do it. We could say, I'm gonna have a type called tuple two, which is a tuple with, with two things in it. Uh, AB equals tuple two AB. You could also make a tuple three and you can imagine going on and on. As an aside, uh, a common name for tuple two is, you know, pair, colloquially, you could call that a pair. Um, tuple three, I've never quite been sure what to call that. I've heard like triple or triplet, but I kind of feel like the spirit of this talk, I should go with three people. That really seems like the, the way to go if we're, you know, being silly and reinventing everything from scratch. Um, so uh, we would probably want to have helper functions like we do in Elm standard library. So uh, tuple two dot first would be, uh, give me a tuple two and I will give you back the first element in it. So A, uh, we probably also want tuple two dot second, which would say, you know, give me a tuple two and I'll give you back the B. Um, and you can imagine, uh, like, one of the downsides of this is that things get a little bit more verbose. So if, if update were built using this version of tuple2 rather than the uh, parentheses syntax, it would be message to model to tuple2 model and then parentheses command message. And uh, you can imagine, you know, similarly with uh, tuples that have three elements that would get, you know, even longer. Um, worth noting that this is actually quite literally what PureScript does. Uh, they, uh, once again, don't have the sugar for that. They just have uh, a type. It's in, in PureScript, it's called pair rather than tuple2. Two, um, which means that since they only have pair, they don't have threeple or anything like that, uh, if you actually want to write the equivalent of what we would in Elm call int, 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 in PureScript this looks like pair, int, and then you just stack another pair in there, pair, int, int, and you know, uh, it works obviously. Uh, these, these concepts are powerful enough that you can sort of use them all the way down like that if you need to. Um, but again, we can see one of the trade-offs here. Uh, int, int, int is a lot more concise than pair, int, parentheses, pair, int, int, and uh, this 
you know, sort of con continues with all the different ways you can use these things. Um, speaking of product type ergonomics, so that's uh, talking about tuples, but uh, what about records? So yes, technically I could get my user from the database and I could just say, I don't know like what the fields are, but like that first one's gonna be username, just remember that. And the second one's gonna be uh, email address, also remember that, and don't ever get them mixed up. Uh, the third one's gonna, you know, you could just, you could do this if you wanted to. This is literally a thing that you can do. Um, are the ergonomics as good as Elm's record system? I'm going to say no. Uh, that's up to you to decide. But um, personally, I would rather use like a nice record type alias than, than use this for all my stuff. But again, we're being kind of silly here. But technically speaking, if I needed to get a user from my database and store it in my uh, application using only custom types as the, the only language feature, yes, I could actually do it. Um, Here's something I actually could not do. So arguably you could say, yeah, yeah, but you don't need to do that. But it, it's actually quite true that if I tried to, in this world where all we have is custom types, implement this function, get username equals dot username, um, I actually couldn't do that using custom types. And the reason is that this, uh, to make a long story short, requires real polymorphism. But um, basically this, this particular feature that says, give me any record, and as long as it's got a username field, I will give you back whatever is in that username field. Yeah, that totally works uh, in, in Elm. But as you can imagine, like I have this user thing here, and I've arbitrarily decided that username is the first of a uh, string in all of this long list of things. How would you possibly write this function such that it takes multiple possible different uh, custom types and still does the right thing um, in, in all cases? I don't think you can really do that in, in kind of the same way. Um, <clears throat> But so what we've been doing here, so this is an example of building product types out of some types. And if you think about it, it kind of makes sense that you'd be able to build product types out of some types, just the way in like arithmetic, you can build products out of sums. If you know how to add things together, you can just add things together a lot, and then you end up with multiplication. Um, in fact, that's how most of us learned multiplication originally. Um, so product types being tuple and record, and, and some types being custom types. Uh, and that's where the title of the talk comes from. Some types all the way down, it's sort of like, yeah, this is a, a pretty fundamental building block that it turns out you can build pretty much everything else uh, on, on top of. Cool. Um, one more note on cardinality and sum versus product types. Um, so let's let's. Uh, this is uh, one of the rare sort of directly practical parts of the talk. Um, let's say we had a type alias for our model, and we were like, okay, I need to load this article from an HTTP request, uh, like right when the page starts up, and I'm going to represent this using a product type, which is to say a record, and we're going to have a bool for is loaded, and we're going to have an article, which is a maybe article. So at first, is loaded will be false, and the article will be nothing, and then when the HTTP request comes back, we'll switch it to is loaded is true, and then article is just some article. And we can also, as a bonus, we can represent errors with this and say, well, if, if we got an error back from the server, the server's down or something, then we can say is loaded is true, uh, but the article is nothing. Um, alternatively, we could do, use a sum type for this and say status equals loading, loaded, and then only the loaded variant has article inside of it or errored. So this is the, the same uh, status that we've had you know, on the previous slides, except that with the addition of this article in the middle here. So we only have article in the specific case where we have uh, successfully loaded it. Um, so uh, you, you, one way we could represent this, uh, take a look at like the different combinations of this, is to put model dot is loaded and model dot article into a tuple. This is for this uh, this initial one, and we could say, okay, is loaded is true, and then we we have an article, and then put the other combinations in there, false in the article, or true and false with nothing. Um, or we could uh, do this with the the status, where we say, okay, only our three options are loading, loaded, in which case we have an article, uh, or errored, in which case we don't. So looking at these in terms of cardinality, the the one where we use the product type, the, the record, we have a cardinality of four, whereas here we only have a cardinality of three. So the question is like, which is better? And the answer is, well, the better one is the one that sort of more accurately matches how many alternatives you have in real life, in your actual problem. So the real question maybe is, is not so much about the numbers, but rather about the mapping between your data model and what can actually happen in reality. Um, so in this case, we actually have a problem here, which is that, what does this one even mean? Like I described the different scenarios out loud, and in what scenario do we have, it's not loaded, but I do have an article. 
what? How does that even happen? Where, where did it come from? I, I don't even know. Um, so if I had written this code, my instinct might be like, uh, I don't know, underscore. And we'll just default to doing something I don't know what. Um, that's like weird and it shouldn't happen. Um, but usually I think uh, underscore should not be for that. Like underscore should really be for you're like, I know for sure what all the other cases are and I actually do want to handle them the same way. Anytime you find yourself saying, I don't know how to handle this, this is a weird scenario, I'm just going to drop an underscore in here and just uh, forget about it. Uh, I think that's a good sign that it's time to take a step back and think more about the data model and, and maybe use fewer product types and more some types. Um, thinking like, uh, how do I reduce the cardinality until it's gotten down to be an exact match, ideally, with, uh, with what my domain has. So. Um, this uh, this has to do with uh, so, some of the stuff that Evan talks about in the uh, types as sets um, appendix uh, has to do with this stuff and and about like making your data model be one to one with uh, the, the cardinality of your types. Okay, let's talk about collections. This is a sweet collection, by the way. Look at this. This is like it's very visually appealing. Um, I don't know what exactly toy that is, but uh, well done, whoever collected that. Um, so uh, one of the basic collection types in Elm is array. Uh, this is something that eh, doesn't tend to get used as frequently as like map, set, or list, which we'll talk about momentarily. Um, the reason that it has this weird looking type is because basically that's what it is under the hood. If you go look at the source for, uh, actually it's, it's, the types are even a little bit weirder than that. I, I made the names a little bit simpler. Um, but if you look at what's going on under the hood in, in the actual like core library, uh, it is this stuff. And that's because this is not actually an array in the sense that you might think of in like C where it's like a contiguous chunk of memory. Uh, rather, this is a hash array mapped try, or hamped for short, which is way more fun to say. Um, and uh, that's what the current implementation of this is. Sort of, it's, uh, This is a common way to have an efficient array-esque data structure that's, uh, that's immutable. Um, and uh, it might actually be moving to, towards a relaxed rate balance tree, which definitely should be pronounced ribbit, as far as I'm concerned. Um, and uh, Robin Hegland Hansen is working on, uh, made the current implementation and uh, is working on, or has been experimenting with, uh, a, a ribbit version. So. Um, point being, uh, this is an array sort of in terms of conceptually how you think of it and what its API supports, but not so much in terms of uh, this is exactly what it is, like it's, it's literally an array. Under the hood, this is what it is, and this is why it has maybe different performance characteristics than you might expect from like a, a C array or something like that. Um, if you thought array was complicated under the hood, wait till you see dict. Uh, dict actually is uh, one of the oldest data structures in Elm that's, that's always been in pure Elm. Um, it's just a whole bunch of <laughs> stuff on this, like rebalancing nodes and all, all this tree stuff going on under the hood. Um, its structure essentially looks like this. Uh, it's either got an empty dict, which I think we can all agree that one's understandable. Um, and then if it's not an empty dict, that's when things start to get a little bit uh, hairy, where you have this like node which has two like ultra dicts underneath of it because it's a tree and uh, and they have this color for like red and black which is a whole computer science thing and uh, basically uh, the the last part of this is the comparable and the V comparable being for the key and then V being for the value um, quick show of hands who's familiar with comparable Okay, um, so for those who uh, aren't, the uh, basically the comparable restriction is basically saying that uh, dictionaries can only have as their keys values that can be compared and, in order to form some ordering of them. So things that can be sort of sorted. So this is like strings, ints, floats, uh, characters, stuff like that. Um, and the reason for that is it's basically, it's entirely a performance optimization. This is a way that dictionaries can sort themselves to be fast for fast lookups and, and fast uh, insertions. <laughs> um, <laughs> But there's no like innate thing saying that like all dictionary keys innately must be comparable. It's more that if you want a fast lookup on your dictionaries and fast insertions, you need that restriction. Um, set is actually quite easy. This is pretty much exactly what set is under the hood. Um, you have a, a set and it's like, oh, uh, sets are pretty much the same thing as dictionaries, but just the key part. So we're literally just gonna actually make it be a dictionary where uh, the key is the useful thing and then the value is uh, unit or in our terminology, unit with uh, <laughs> capital U. So, I mean, actually, it is quite possible to re-implement all of the core Elm data structures, um, except for lists, which we'll get to in a second, which is actually even easier than this, um, just using plain old Elm stuff. And uh, the performance might not be as good. Like, some of these under the hood have, like, some special purpose stuff that's, like, written in raw JavaScript to speed them up even further. Um, but other than that, I mean, in general, yeah, you absolutely can implement these in pure Elm and, and sort of get back to that point. Um, 
One other note about comparable, uh, like I said, it's not a hard requirement, it's just a performance optimization. Uh, if you've ever been like, ah, I really want a, a thing that works exactly like dictionary but without the comparable restriction, and you're okay with taking a performance hit, um, uh, the author of the, uh, the Elm iOS experiment from Google Summer of Code, uh, Palmer Paul, uh, he wrote uh, Association List, which basically is a drop-in replacement for dictionary, like the API is exactly the same, except that it doesn't have the comparable restriction and it's slower, uh, because it has to be. <laughs> um, so uh, if you've ever found yourself in that exact boat, this might be a useful thing to, to take away from this uh, talk where I'm, I'm trying as hard as I can to make not useful, but uh, <laughs> nevertheless, here's, th this is a potentially useful thing to know. Um, okay, so list is actually the easiest of these, uh, of, of all the collections in Elm, because much like maybe and bool, it just is a plain old uh, custom type that's that's got its uh, constructors exposed, or its variants exposed. Um, so either it's empty, which is to say we have an empty list, or it's like, okay, uh, prepend some value onto another list. So this is actually a recursive type. Uh, it refers to itself in its own definition. Um, so there is, of course, syntax sugar for this in Elm with the, the square braces, but if we didn't have this syntax sugar, uh, this is what we would do. <laughs> the equivalent of uh, open brace, close brace is uh, just saying we have empty. The equivalent of one inside braces is prepend one empty. So that's to say, uh, start with empty and then prepend one to it, and that's this, this second variant here. If we wanted to have one and two, it'd be prepend one, two, prepend two, and then empty, and then uh, and so on and so forth. This is just, just keep stacking out and out, kind of like pure scripts tuples. Um, so this totally works. This is a thing you could build if you wanted. If you're like, ah, I don't want list, I want to call it something else. You could build this from scratch, and it would, you know, uh, pretty much work the same way. Um, this does have some interesting implications for performance. Um, as you can see, if, if you're not familiar with this already, uh, prepending stuff to the list, like adding stuff onto the front, is very cheap. But if you wanted to add something onto the end, you basically have to traverse all the way through this, and then change this empty to something else and then staple back on all the prepends again. Um, so this is why, if you've ever wondered why, like adding stuff to the beginning of the list is strongly encouraged and pretty good for performance, and adding stuff to the end of the list is not, this is why. Because this is the exact structure that the list has under the hood. Um, okay, in terms of cardinality, oh, how do you have the cardinality of a recursive type? Like, do we just like add them up? Well, yeah, cardinality is infinity. Uh, it's just like infinitely uh, cardinalist. So basically, uh, you know, if you tried to add up all the possibilities, you end up saying, oh, well, wait, hang on, I have to add up all the cardinality of this, and then you keep looping back on yourself, and eventually you end up with, okay, yeah, there's just infinite possibilities on this thing. Technically, that's not quite true, which gets into Evan's types as bits uh, article, but I mean, really, yes, the, eventually the machine will run out of memory, and, and you can't actually have something that's infinitely long and, and be like, oh, yes, I'll just put that with your infinite memory that you have in your infinitely large computer. Um, but in terms of thinking about this as like cardinality and, and uh, sort of conceptually, it's essentially infinite. Could we have a cardinality of zero? Is that a thing we could have? Any guesses? Anyone, can anyone think of a type that might have a cardinality of zero? No. Yeah, never. Um, so this is essentially the type of uh, never. Uh, this is actually a surprisingly useful thing, having something with a cardinality of zero. Uh, it, it's essentially defined this way. Uh, type never equals give me one more never. I forget what the exact term is in the, in the actual thing, but it's something along the lines of give me one more. And the reason for that name is that basically try to instantiate one of these. Like try try to make one. You're like, I, I want to have a value whose type is never, please. And let me, let me see if I can make one of those. It's like, okay, well, there's only one variant, so that's what I have have to use. So I'm going to call give me one more. What does it take as its argument? Oh, it takes a never. So I have to, okay, well, I'll just, I'll call it again and then I'll, uh, yeah. So you, you can never succeed at the, the, this goal. Like you just keep need to call and give me one more, but you never, you, it never terminates. Um, so that's kind of the whole point is it's, it's uh, something with a cardinality of zero because there's actually no way to make one of these at all. That's kind of the whole point. And the first time I heard of this, I was like, that's extremely useless. That's sort of aggressively useless. How would you possibly, like, why would you want this? Um, it turns out there's a couple of cases where this is actually quite handy. Um, so one example is task.perform from the core library. So this is basically saying, give me a value and a way to turn it into a message. And then I, I want you to give me a task never value, and then I'll give you back a command that sort of translated this task into a command. So really what this is saying is it's saying, since I demand that you give me a task with a never as its error type, that's basically saying a task that can never fail, which is to say, give me a task where it has no restrictions on it 
it's error type. Like it's a t it's a, like a task dot succeed, for example. It's something that still has an unbound type variable there, such that it's able to uh, sort of fit into any task slot, even one which requires something that's impossible if if I were to actually be able to instantiate it. So this tends to be where never comes up is where you have something where you're sort of saying, I demand that you give me a value which still has an unbound type variable in it. Now, I know some of you might be thinking like, what is an unbound type variable? Uh, like, I, like I said, drink from the fire hose. This is an interesting thing to be aware of. You know, let's not uh, go too far down the rabbit hole on any one particular thing. But <laughs> I do want to give a shout out to another really useful use of uh, never, which is for accessibility. So my coworker Tessa Kelly uh, makes this awesome library called Accessible HTML, and it does things like saying, you know how like it's best practice where uh, you're not supposed to make a div that's just like clickable. Like, you're not supposed to like make a div and then say on click and then uh, you know put some text in there. Um, not because like you're a bad person if you do, but because you're just making accessibility worse if you do that. It's much better to use a button or an A tag or something that's actually designed to be clickable because if I'm consuming this content on a screen reader, uh, they actually look for clues uh, as to like which things are interactive versus not um, based on the, the element type. So what this library does, among many other things, is uh, it changes the type. It's sort of a drop-in replacement for Elm HTML. Uh, it changes the type of div to be a list of attribute never, and then otherwise div is exactly the same. So essentially what this means is it says, hey, you can only give me sort of inert attributes that don't have any messages associated with them, which means they don't have any handlers on them. So you can totally say, I want to style my div. You can put class in there. You can put any kind of stuff that you want, except for event handlers. <laughs> so you actually cannot, at compile time, it will prevent you from trying to put an on click inside of your div. So instead, you have to be like, oh, right, yes, uh, yes, I'll put a button there or something else. Um, so this is, I think, a really cool, clever use of never, and it's sort of an example of like uh, how it can be used like beyond just the core libraries. This is something that she just made you know, uh, on her own, and this is something that absolutely anyone in this room can do if you come up with a, a good use case for it. Um, so all of these things are sort of examples of the stuff that I talked about in, in making impossible states impossible is basically trying to rule out things that should not be allowed. This is not really a state so much as a configuration, um, but in general, a lot of this like types of sets, cardinality type stuff is about trying to figure out what can we rule out, what can we make guarantees around um, such that sort of the reality of like what's, what's good, what's our goal lines up with um, what, what's going on in our types. <clears throat> okay. Um, this brings me to numbers. So uh, let's say we wanted to define a, a thing called whole number. This is not, we're not quite at int yet, but I'm like, yeah, I want to have a whole number and it's either going to be one or it's going to be increment that. So this is basically using the same trick that we did with list. So one is O-N-E, okay, fair enough. Um, two is increment one, three is increment, increment one, et cetera, et cetera. We could do this. A um, couple of downsides here. One is this is way less ergonomic than just writing the number one, uh, like writing out all this nonsense. Um, number two, this is way slower than that. I mean, under the hood, like the actual integers are, are blazing fast in comparison to building up this whole data structure. Um, so in general, all the stuff we're about to talk about with regards to numbers is going to have both of those downsides. Uh, the ergonomics are going to be worse and the uh, the, the performance is going to be atrocious. Um, however, we could do this, and we've we've uh, we've actually restricted the sort of domain of our numbers. We've said we can't have zero, and we can't have negative numbers. That's potentially useful. Um, you can take this one step further and, and say, uh, you know what, I want to do basically the same thing except I want to allow zero. I'm going to use the term successor instead of uh, increment here because that's actually the terminology uh, used by this particular thing. Nat is short for natural numbers and this is uh, sort of the same idea as what we saw previously with whole number uh, but with starting at zero instead of starting at one. The reason I use that terminology is that these are actually called uh, piano numbers. Um, piano numbers, I don't know, I'm American, sorry. Uh, but this is from an, say it with me now, 18th century Italian mathematician, uh, Giuseppe Piano, I don't know, sorry. Um, somebody said it correctly. I'm not gonna attempt to reproduce that, but <laughs> now we all know, it'll be on the recording. Um, and uh, basically he, he came up with this representation for ways of encoding numbers. And it works for natural numbers, for whole numbers, and for really any kind of starting point you wanna think of. Um, Idris, by the way, uh, actually uses this in their in their core data types. Like this is a sort of a bread and butter thing in Idris. It's it's uh, not just something that you would go out of your way to get. Um, 
some potential use cases for this. Uh, one would be, okay, so currently an Elm string dot length returns an int, but we all know like if you get a string with negative length, something has gone wrong. So it would be kind of nice if you could rule that out. Well, I mean, this, this is a way that that could be done. Obviously there are, like we said, performance and ergonomics downsides. Um, so that's kind of the reason that <laughs> Elm string dot length doesn't do that. Um, but you could do that and that would be sort of an upside to doing this. So if you're making some custom type of your own and you're like, oh, I actually think it's really important that I not give you back uh, like any negative numbers from the length, you could consider doing something like this uh, to rule that out if you, if you really, really wanted that. And we're okay with paying the penalty in terms of ergonomics and performance. Um, Array.get is an example of uh, putting it in the argument position rather than the return value. So as you can imagine, if Array.get took, took a nat instead of an int, then uh, you would no longer have this scenario where you accidentally subtract your way into having a negative number and are like, give me you know, Array.get negative one. Now, there granted are some languages where they're like, actually, that's a feature. Negative one means we wrap around from the end, which, you know, uh, is sort of an arguable, like, wh whether or not that's a, a good design. On the one hand, it's kind of convenient. It handles the fact that, well, yeah, we can pass negative numbers to it. But on the other hand, it's sort of like, well, uh, if I subtracted too much and I actually, like, got into negative territory accidentally, this isn't going to help me rule that out. So, yeah, lots of trade-offs to consider there. Certainly, this is something to, to be aware of, like, worth knowing in case you run into a scenario where you actually want something exactly like this. Um, related to piano, yeah, the, the Italian guy numbers um, uh, is uh, the the concept of, of a, a list where you have, or a collection, I guess, um, where head doesn't need to return maybe because the length of the list is actually tracked in the types. So I have a, a uh, implementation of this uh, on GitHub. Uh, I should, probably should have put that as a GitHub URL because I didn't bother publishing it. Because as I put in the uh, in the in the repo, I actually don't know of a use case for this. Um, I just wanted to do it to see if it could be done, which sure enough it can. Um, but anyway, you can check it out if you're interested in it. Um, here's an example from that uh, that code. Uh, basically, let's say I wanted to get the first string in some vector. And I was calling vector dot head on two strings, which is the vector I, I put two strings into it. That'll just give me back a string. And that'll compile, it'll work, there's no maybe involved, uh, because it actually knows at the type level like how many things are left in it. It's like, oh, well that, that one I know has two things in it. Um, we'll see how that works in a second. Uh, and so it's like, oh yeah, I can definitely give you back a string. Meanwhile, if I try to call vector.head on an empty vector, it will not even compile, it just won't work. Um, and you might say like, wow, that sounds amazing. Why don't we do this all the time? Okay, hang on. So here's what the type of this is. Uh, the type of the two strings one is vector, one more than one more than empty. So it's basically the list slash piano numbers trick except moved into the type of this uh, vector thing. And then also PS is a vector of strings. And so the empty one is vector empty string. So you have this sort of middle thing that tracks how many things are in it. Um, as you can imagine, if you wanted a vector with a thousand things, do not try to write that type out because that will be your entire repository. But uh, well, again, it's a technique you can be aware of. This is a thing that can work if you ever find yourself like really needing this, uh, it's, it's available. Um, okay, all of which brings us to an actually uh, sort of bread and butter type, int. Uh, so here's one way we could represent int. We need to like positive and negative numbers. We got zero, negative zero, stay with me, and successor int. Um, so why did I go with negative zero here? Well, I mean, this is actually kind of a problem. Like with the whole number one, we were like, okay, well, yeah, we'll just increment. And with nat, we're like, yeah, we'll just increment. But here we need to be able to go in two directions. We need to be able to have zero. And then we also need to be able to go like in that direction and get more negative. And then we also need to be able to go more positive. So in this uh, perhaps ill-advised encoding of this, we've got zero, successor zero goes in the positive direction. So that'll give us one. Negative zero, uh, successor go goes in the negative direction. And then of course we can and you know, keep going further negative or further positive. Okay, but it kind of sucks having zero and negative zero. Like that's some float stuff. Um, so here's what we could do instead. We could say, uh, let's make there's just one zero and we just have two operations. One is increment and one is decrement. So that's like a little bit nicer. So now we have zero, increment zero, increment, increment zero, decrement zero, increment, decrement. And, oh, wait a minute, now we have a problem. So if you think about it, now that we've got increment and decrement, now we could just have another way to represent one is increment, decrement, increment, decrement, increment, decrement, increment, decrement, increment. That's one. Oh. So now we actually have way more possible like uh, overlapping ways to represent the same thing than we did before with just negative zero and positive zero. So this is actually considerably worse than negative zero and positive zero. Ugh. 
okay, okay, what if we use the whole number one that we made earlier, and we're like, yeah, here we go. So we can basically be like either zero, or positive one, or positive increment one, or positive, negative one, or negative increment one. Okay, this is actually a pretty reasonable representation of, uh, of integers, except that it's gonna be pretty slow. So uh, if we really wanted to be fast, we should just do what the actual hardware wants, which is to represent these things using bits, so like zero and one. So here's a way we could do that, is we just say, int is just a list of bits, and this is what the computer does under the hood. Um, and if you want to learn more about that, take a look at Evan's uh, types as bits. Um, but basically, without going into how all the math of this works, the essential idea is to say zero is a list that only has zero in it. Um, one is a list that has a one in it. We're in binary, so all we've got is zero and one. Um, for two, we're going to have one followed by zero. And it's basically the, the algorithm for this is you take the rightmost thing and then multiply it by two to the power of whatever that is, and then move over one and multiply by two to the power of whatever that is. And uh, eventually, you can end up representing everything with this. Uh, 0, 1, 2, 3 is, uh, 3 is 1, comma 1, and then you would add more and more digits onto the side as you wanted to represent more and more things. But that's no fun. Uh, so if you, if you want uh, sort of more about uh, binary representations of things, check out that article. Um, also worth noting that modern hardware actually uses two's, two's complement for speed, so not quite this, and that has some implications with negative numbers. But um, at any rate, uh, if th this is probably not something you would ever actually want to write in your own code. Um, <clears throat> worth noting, though, that now that we have int, we can also do char, because char is essentially just a Unicode code point, which is an integer. Um, we can also do string, because string is essentially just a list of chars. And in fact, in the Haskell standard library, that literally is what, what string is. It's, it's literally a list of chars. Um, okay, float. I made jellyfish because they float and also because they sting you. Um, so, uh, <laughs> uh, has anyone ever gotten this? Uh, we've been surprised by this. You put this into Elm Repl and you get they're like, what? What? Well, that's not point, point 0.1 plus point 0.2 is. Um, but in this case, it actually is uh, because floats have precision problems. Um, they also have other problems like not a number is really weird. Infinity and negative infinity are really weird. Negative zero exists in floats, which we already decided was a bad idea. Um, but you gotta remember that, that where floats come from is this standard that came out in 1985, which was the year that literal original Nintendo came out in North America. Um, that was like the hardware they were dealing with at the time. And they had some, they had some design constraints. Um, so they had to be cross hardware, they had to be cross language, errors must be recoverable, and it has to run really fast. Um, all of these things put together mean that uh, actually there were like good reasons that they chose to use infinity and not a number and things like that. They needed a well-defined result that would not throw a machine interrupt or trap or anything like that. Um, and it's called a floating point because essentially it's like the decimal point, or, or uh, it's not really a decimal because it's using twos under the hood instead of tens. Uh, it can float around. So you have like one bit for the sign, it's either positive or negative. Uh, you have the significant, which is sort of the, the digits in the number, and then the exponent, which is like where the point goes. Um, if you want to learn more about this, there's a, a really nicely written uh, website about all of these things. You can kind of like understand why floats work the way that they do. Um, but again, kind of boring because that's how things, uh, things work under the hood. Um, int is a 52 bit integer as a consequence of this, so that is something worth noting in Elm. So if you're decoding like a 64-bit integer if out of JSON, that'll work in JSON. That might work on your server in your database, but it's not going to fit in, in the browser because you've only got 52 bits worth of integer to work with there. So that's a sort of gotcha that doesn't come up very often, but if it does, watch out. Um, some possible alternatives to float. Um, one way we could do this is we could say, hey, I'm just going to make a type called ratio that's got a numerator int and a denominator int. You could absolutely do that. Um, you could make your own type for that. Now you do have some problems, though. Like, what's the type of divide? It'd be nice to say it's ratio to ratio to ratio, but like, what about if the if you put in zero for the thing you're dividing by? Uh-oh. Like, what does division by zero do if it's not going to return infinity, which we just kind of agreed that we wanted to get away from? Um, there are various ways to deal with this, uh, the most interesting of which perhaps is what Pony, and as I recently learned, Oak, which you'll hear about from Mario tomorrow, uh, do, which is they just define that like if you divide by zero, you get back zero. Um, but there are other alternatives, uh, arbitrary precision, rationals, which is known as big num. I couldn't find any Elm libraries for that, but there actually is a uh, decimal library that has like uh, longer precision decimals. So point being, if you're doing things like calculations with currency, especially, um, definitely uh, make sure that you uh, have uh, some alternative to float uh, uh, as like one of the things on your radar because uh, they do have precision problems and they're not necessarily something you have to live with. Okay, last but not least, we come to implementing functions using custom types. Now you might be like, whoa, whoa, I, I've heard of lambda calculus, you can build everything out of functions. How are we gonna build functions using custom types? All right, let's do it. Let's say I wanted to write this function called describe int, which takes an int, and you're like, if int is zero, then it returns the string zero, otherwise non-zero. 
So in the Elm compiler, if you actually dig into the source code, what it's doing is it's uh, doing some parsing, like you might do with Elm parser, to turn this string into a representation of this expression. And the type for that looks something along the lines of this. It's like, okay, we might have an int value, like an int literal. We might have a string value, a string literal. We might have a bool uh, literal. We might have a variable, which is like, give me the string name of that variable, and I'll go look up the current value as it is in that current scope. Uh, we might have an equality comparison, which takes two expressions and returns true if they're equal and otherwise uh, returns false. Uh, we might have if, which is going to have uh, two branches. One is the expression to evaluate if it's true, and then the other if it's false. And this right here is enough of an expression, that which we've done using a custom type, to represent the function we just wrote in Elm code as a value. So here's what that would look like. This describe int thing that's exactly the same as before. Here's how we'd write that as an expression. So we'd start by saying uh, if, so that's that's one of the things in our expression, equal variable int and int val zero. So this is our condition in the if, uh, and we're using our equal equals comparison, which takes two expressions. One is gonna be the variable int, which is right here, and the other is a hard-coded int value of zero. And then we're gonna, for our if true branch, we're gonna say evaluate to the string value zero, and if false, evaluate to the string value non-zero. And that's the end. That's, the, that's this function translated to a custom type representation of that expression. And then it's like, okay, well, we have that, but how do you actually you know, turn it into code that runs? Uh, the answer is you basically write a function called eval. So here's how we would do that. Uh, this is gonna take a, uh, a dictionary uh, from string to expression, and it's going to be uh, basically, th this is the variables that are in scope or, or the arguments, and it's gonna return a new expression. Or sorry, it's gonna take an expression and then return a maybe expression. Why a maybe expression? Because there is something that can go wrong, which we will see momentarily. So uh, this is the eval function. Uh, it takes the, the variables that are in scope and then the expression. We do a case expression on this. We've got, uh, if it's an int val, we're like, okay, just leave it alone. Like that's, that evaluates to itself because it's already sort of as reduced as it possibly can be. Same thing with string. Um, if we've got a variable, we go look it up in the dictionary. So this is one example of how things could fail. Um, what happens if you have a variable whose name doesn't actually appear in your dictionary of variables? Um, this is something that dynamically typed languages have to run into. It's like you can actually execute your program you can eval it, and then partway through, you're like, oh, you wrote this variable name, but it, does, does, it hasn't been defined anywhere. Oh, well, I guess we blow up. That's a runtime exception. Um, Elm has a nice you know, compiler that does a pass and, and verifies these things. Uh, but yeah, I mean, this, this just can happen if we, if we haven't done that. Um, equal uh, is uh, relatively straightforward. We're saying just compare A and B, like whatever those two expressions are. Um, ideally, we might want to call eval on those because uh, depending on how they get evaluated, they might get uh, re reduced to different values, but this is the essence of the idea. Um, and then uh, finally, we have if, which is the, the last bit here. So we have the condition and the branches. So first thing we're gonna do is do case condition of, and again, probably in, in real life, we'd wanna eval the condition because there might be a, you know, stuff going on there. Um, if it's true, then we're gonna eval the, the true branch, and uh, if it's false, then we're going to eval the false branch. Um, one thing worth noting is that uh, you notice that we're only gonna evaluate one or the other branch. We're not gonna evaluate both, which is why conditionals will only actually execute one branch or the other. So uh, here we have now basically said, uh, oh yeah, <laughs> one more thing, which is uh, what happens if the condition isn't a bool value? We have a runtime type error, it's gonna crash. So this is another thing you run into in uh, dynamically typed languages all the time. Um, so if you really wanted to, you could use this to build an Elm parser and an Elm evaluator so that if you were exhibit, you're, you're like, yo dog, I heard you like Elm, so I put Elm in your Elm so you can Elm while you Elm, and you could actually like write a complete parser and evaluator for Elm and actually run some Elm from your Elm. Again, not saying I recommend this, but it's something you could do. Something a little bit more practical uh, use for this is uh, you could write your own effect manager. Uh, this is something that I've seen people do is basically say like, I want to describe the set of exact effects that I can do. Like I can send an HTTP request or I can send to a port and like a very constrained list of things that I can do. And then essentially write an eval type function that turns that into a command. What's cool about this is that you can actually write multiple interpreters like this. So you could say run with debug logging, which has the same type and you could swap this in and out very easily. But it would, in, in addition to doing all these effects, it would like log some useful stuff for you along the way. Or you could uh, write a test for this that says, I'm gonna take this thing and just turn it into an expression. Um, so this is a technique that I've seen people use, not usually all the time, but uh, for certain particular use cases, it, it can be a, a useful thing. Basically, writing an, uh, sort of an expression or an effect type and then writing multiple interpreters for it. 
Okay, so to sum up, this is where we've ended up uh, with like, what if the only language feature Elm had was custom types? We remade bool, we remade maybe, unit, tuple2, two, and even arbitrarily long records, like these entire product types. Um, we did the collections, so array, dict, set, and list, list being the easiest one. Um, and we even got into stuff like numbers and characters and strings and nats and ints. Um, and along the way, we kind of saw variations on these that are potentially more practical uh, for certain use cases than others, but at least like interesting things to know about that you can do. And finally, we even looked at like float and some maybe more reasonable alternatives, especially if you're dealing with currency. <laughs> Last but not least, we talked about functions and how you can actually write out an entire expression like to, to represent the body of a function and, uh, and even like custom effects, which you can write multiple interpreters for, for your own code. So, as I said at the beginning, this is probably going to be a bit of a drink from the fire hose, um, but at the end of the day, I, hopefully this, this sort of inspired you or taught you something. Quick show of hands, how many people learned at least one thing from this? Okay, that's I think everyone. <laughs> Excellent. Um, so yeah, uh, hopefully these are things that you can you know take to your uh, Elm learnings from now on, and hopefully you had some fun along the way. Thanks very much.